Thank you, Kathy. And that's my day job. For the last three years, they've had me leading some web application development projects, too. So, long story. But anyway, w welcome, everybody. I know we're all anxious to get to the reception. It's been a long day. Your head's probably full of information. And you want to get out of here. So I'll try to make this light and breezy. And cruelly, they, they started the exhibits. The exhibits open 10 minutes before this presentation is scheduled to end which compels me to talk very fast and, you know, just don't ask any questions. Okay? If you feel a question coming on, lie down till it goes away. Um, the other thing is I'm a late addition to the program. I was called up from the minor leagues when one of the speakers got injured or they put him on waivers or something. Um, so this isn't in, on your CD, uh, but it is on the handouts website, although I've tweaked it a little since then. So we'll get it updated in the next couple of days. By the time you get home, if you download it then, it will be the, this version that you're seeing now. So um, uh, we're going to briefly tell you about the company and the problem we were trying to, uh, to uh, solve, the solutions. This, this is a case study of a homegrown solution set. It was homegrown because when we started on this about eight years ago, uh, the, the, the tools market in this particular problem space was not very robust. Uh, so um, today, I'm really describing um, the, the problem and the approach we took in the solutions that you might be able to use as a lens through which to evaluate MDM solutions. Or actually, some of the metadata tools are encroaching on this problem. Some of the MDM tools are encroaching on this problem. Maybe somebody has the total solution. Maybe you need a combination of them. Um, then we'll discover how we went. So we were working. Originally, in the, in the analytical space, we're probably trying to solve um, an analytics integration problem. But as we built our service-oriented architecture the last few years, we leveraged the same tool set and the same approaches there. So we'll describe how that happened and, and talk about the whole uh, uh, convergence and then some you know, big, profound takeaway messages. Or they may be very simplistic takeaway messages, but hopefully they'll be useful anyway. Um, so uh, b about Harvard Pilgrim, uh, we're a nonprofit uh, health plan in New England, serving uh, about uh, something over a million members now. Uh, been around since the uh, late 1960s when started as, as a community-based HMO plan. Um, ranked one of the, for eight years in a row, as, as the uh, uh, top health plan in America. Uh, I work in corporate information management, which is a teeny tiny division of IT that um, sits at the sort of intersection of business and IT. We're the bridge. So we work in, in uh, uh, analytics, business intelligence, data warehousing, uh, data governance, uh, data quality initiatives, and data architecture, which, which is supposed to be my day job. Um, technical environment, uh, we, have a, we have a heavy Oracle footprint in our, uh, um, the Oracle uh, e-business suite. Uh, we use Oracle transactional databases for other stuff. The warehouse is on Teradata. And for the last few years, we've been working on migrating from our old legacy business in a box monolithic system to a component architecture integrated through SOA, which has not been easy to do. I had solid brown hair when we started out on it, and look what's happened. Um, <clears throat> it's an analytics intensive environment. Uh, so we have a lot of data analysts working on complex problems in, uh, in, in typical kinds of insurance problems as well as medical informatics problems uh, who are uh, very uh, technically uh, oriented. And in, in fact, we've, we've just uh, reorged a bunch of them under a new VP of medical inform informatics to make that function even more uh, uh, r robust. Uh, so let's start by level setting first with w what do we mean by reference data? because it isn't always clear. Some people describe it differently. Um, I'll borrow from Malcolm Chisholm. Some of you may have uh, heard Malcolm's presentation earlier today. Um, uh, way back in 2001, he wrote an article for TDAN in which he said, reference data is any kind of data that is used solely to categorize other data found in a database or solely for relating data in a database to information beyond the boundaries of the enterprise, which is a very thorough and, and crisp uh, definition. Uh, another quote, reference data is the core of your enterprise vocabulary, what you use to describe and define your business and give useful meaning to your data assets. That was said by me just now. <laughs> and you were there. Um, uh, so I, I think uh, that it is you know, the core of your enterprise sem semantics is in your reference data. It's in your metadata and your reference data. And the, the, the key uh, function of it is to give useful meaning. Um, 
Malcolm also has handed out in the past, I don't know if he will uh, this year, his uh, framework for enterprise data classification, which I kind of like actually. It's useful in data governance discussions to talk about what layer of the cake we're operating in. You don't have to read the eye chart. It's the large concepts that are important. At the top of the stack, he has metadata, our all important data about our data. At the bottom of the stack, he has the <coughs> detailed transaction stuff, the, the stuff that flows in and out of our enterprises on a uh, daily or minute by minute basis. And in the middle, he has this thing called master data, at the top of which he clearly delineates and segregates reference data. Uh, which um, a lot of people don't, and especially in MDM strategies, reference data is sort of subsumed under other domains and it's just going to come along for the ride. I think it, it deserves a kind of its own holistic approach and its own care and feeding. And that's one of the takeaway messages I hope you uh, take today. The other thing I want to dis uh, distinguish are, are our homonyms, reference CE and reference TS. Um, the TS references are import reference are important uh, because uh, they are the global identifiers that uniquely identify uh, an individual, a product, a customer, a location, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <coughs> they are often included under the umbrella of reference CE data. I'm explicitly segregating them as, as a separate problem space. So this is about the reference data that, that categorize and semantically enrich your other data. Uh, so uh, Malcolm sort of agrees with that. Another piece of that handout that he, it's a, it's a big tabloid thing, so you can't show it on one uh, slide, but um, uh, he categorizes them as external reference data, things like, you know, uh, postal service codes, uh, uh, country codes, ISO standards, that kind of thing. Uh, data structure data that defines uh, subtypes, types of transactions, that kind of thing. Taxonomies and classification schemes, which are actually a big driver of, of the work that we did in this space. Uh, rates, values, constants, other, other kinds of things that, that are um, uh, sort of uh, uh, in, intrinsic in the world but need to be uh, explicitly described in your data. So, so that's the realm of reference data that we're discussing here. Um, so the initial problem we were trying to solve was um, in 2005, we uh, put into production the first release of our enterprise data warehouse, which was a very different paradigm from, from the legacy data marts. Uh, of course, what we were doing was homogenizing data from many sources into actually a common third normal form database at the base. And we, we denormalize that into presentation views, but, but the base model is, in, is 3NF. And, um, and now, of course, as we're replacing the old platform, a lot of this is decomposed into multiple sources, and this is imminently to be, to be replaced, and will also get homogenized uh, into here. Now, <coughs> in the warehouse, um, analysts, analysts uh, uh, using the legacy marts did a lot of their own aggregation and categorization of data, group procedures and diagnoses into uh, you know, instead of all the detailed categories, roll them up into higher level, anically useful groups, uh, rationalizing multiple source system codes uh, over the course of, of the, the life of the le legacy system, 20 relationship dependents, uh, 20 types of, you have a subscriber to healthcare and you have all their dependents who are also on their contract. We somehow evolved more than 20 types of those relationships. We've rationalized those down to seven. Uh, so that, that rationalization, now, now we have to do it all over again for the new system, right? Uh, so that's uh, maintained by the business as well. Um, categorizing benefit plan designs across uh, six dimensions. Uh, and so <coughs> the way this was maintained is these, these were kept in, you know, local SAS data sets or Excel spreadsheets or Comet Limited sets, all the usual suspects. And um, uh, they would send a monthly service request to IT saying, please update this little set of reference data that I'm responsible for. So here was the process. Business sends a request to IT, and <coughs> if you paid attention to Terry Mulholland's slides this morning, either we share the same clip art library, or my business guy once worked for the IRS. I'm not sure which. But in any case, business sends a request to IT, the, uh, the load cycle happens, <coughs> error happens, uh, depending on the severity of the error, pa pagers go off in the middle of the night, and so on. And uh, you know they have to get back to the business guy, say, fix this. And, on the cycle goes, and this is what we unaffectionately refer to as the churn. This, I, can, I think we can all agree, is not good. 
So uh, the, the parallel problem or concurrent problem is that code sets were often the private property of a department or even an individual analyst kept on the desktop or kept in some offline data mart. Um, this inherently diminishes the value of the enterprise warehouse and it means that different departments are producing different results for their, for their constituents, which is also not a good thing. So the goal was to man manage some enterprise sources of truth for those reference data, uh, maintain the master data in the transaction environment and mirror it to the EDW uh, make it production grade to so put the right kind of controls and backups and validations and auditability and that kind of thing around it. Uh, make them accessible across the enterprise and identify data stewards tasked with the responsibility for the accuracy, timeliness, quality of the reference data. Also ensuring valid uh, entry at the, at the time of entry, uh, which is a point we'll uh, get back to in a moment. So the solution set, the first one is totally unprofound. We made a schema. We designated an Oracle database schema. This is going to be the corporate reference center, three-letter acronym, everything works. Um, and uh, that's where we're going to house these reference data sets in relational tables rather than uh, offline. Uh, and we set up a bunch of principles about, about what goes in to the uh, CRC. Uh, it's data that doesn't originate from an application. So it's, it's really you know, extrinsic to any uh, system of record. Uh, it's relevant to the enterprise. Uh, Har Harvard Pilgrim is the authoritative source. So the industry standard data we have in a separate place. In fact, we have in multiple separate places depending on the system that m m most needs it first. <laughs> Um, but, uh, uh, and I'll talk about that later on when we get to SOA, but, um, uh, you know, uh, industry standard code sets like, you know, pr uh, ICD-9 and procedure codes and SIC codes and all that kind of stuff lives elsewhere. This is for uh, stuff we're originating uh, inside our enterprise. Uh, it, it may be a classification scheme or, you know, one of those taxonomies. It has an identified data steward. And, the, the DDL goes through a gatekeeper, uh, a committee of which I'm the chair, that if you can't say who the business data steward is for this, we're not putting it in until you go find that person. And uh, may have one or more consumers in the enterprise. In other words, it's really enterprise grade. It's not a private uh, thing. And um, uh, so obviously this has some governance requirements. Um, if you're going to standardize 20 dependent types down to seven, say, you need some cross-functional dialogue among the stakeholders to say what are the seven values, or however many it turns out to be, that we're going to agree on. Uh, and this was an ad hoc process also that we instigated in corporate information management, which was round up the usual suspects. Um, what movie is that from? Usual suspects. No, no, round up the usual suspects. It's not a Western. <laughs> Major Strasser has been shot. Round up the usual suspects. <laughs> Casablanca. <clears throat> okay, it's, it's a classic line at the end of Casablanca. And, uh, well, no, it, the, the next line was where we have the feeling it's the, the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> we'll have more movie trivia at the end of the presentation. Um, and, uh, but, but actually started our early kind of nascent uh, efforts in our uh, data governance journey uh, was around, uh, part of it was around the, the reference data problem. Now this slide reduces to, um, to four tight bullets, about a 10-year <laughs> journey uh, in implementing <laughs> data governance at Harvard Pilgrim. And it was a story of, of bottom-up meets top-down. So historically, we would run around uh, gathering stakeholders who might have input around certain data uh, pain points uh, largely as an ad hoc, quasi-formalized process. We actually created standing committees with you know, monthly meetings and that kind of thing. Or we just gather people when a new pain point uh, popped up. So it was very much you know, the usual suspects kind of approach. But in 2008, when we adopted our five-year um, IT replatforming uh, strategy, right, moving off that old monolith into the new SOA environment, uh, we actually got buy-in from the senior executives of the company that enterprise data management uh, principles were vital to making this succeed and that data governance uh, was one of those principles and that data governance was a function of the business. 
So now we had the top-down imperative to <coughs> formalize what we were doing in a kind of ad hoc way. Yes? Um, so a, a lot of the pain point wasn't so much around the reference data. Uh, it was certainly useful to formalize uh, groups with, with input around how we were going to rationalize, harmonize uh, reference data when you're consolidating them from multiple sources into the data warehouse. Our data quality issues were more in the operational environment. You know, our provider data at one point was really a mess. We could, we, in, in the late 1990s, we couldn't pay providers right. It was, it was a result of, of, of a merger of, of, two, of two health plans together with multiple GL systems and multiple claim processing systems. And um, uh, basically, the, the company went bankrupt in 1999. We, we went into a receivership in 1999, which concentrates the mind wonderfully. And, um, <laughs> and says we'd better get formal about our data management practices, which is when we embarked on developing an enterprise logical data model, forming some data quality committees around particular pain points, that kind of thing. We also do a lot of in, uh, data exchanges with third parties, and the healthcare payer sector is uh, uh, primitive relative to other industries in standardization of data exchange. Everything was a one-off, always had problems. So we had you know, committees around uh, pharmacy data quality, behavioral health data quality, because those are benefits that are actually managed by third parties, that kind of thing. Does that answer your question? About 160 now. So CR <laughs> when CRC was first conceived, there was something like 34 uh, uh, code sets that they were worried about, that they initially identified. But CRC has now grown considerably. Um, so uh, we have the executive imperative. Now we can go uh, uh, get commitment of resources from the business to um, uh, support the data governance uh, function. Uh, and uh, uh, with end-to-end -end representation, data producers and data consumers, so you have the operational folks and the analytical folks sitting at the table together, which was novel. Uh, consistent charters and responsibility, or I could just as well say accountability, for enterprise reference data within their particular domains. So we have the schema that we, where we store stuff. We have the people and processes for, for governing it. What tool set do we give them? And as I said, when we, when we embarked on this many years ago, there wasn't really a tool that did what this thing I'm about to describe does, which is why we built our own. But today, you very well may not have to. So I created this thing called the Reference Table Utility, also a three-letter acronym. That's very important in anything you name. Um, and uh, this is what we call the, the, the loading dock and inventory control for master reference data. Um, it will accept data, uh, upload by us from a spreadsheet or a flat file, or you can type data directly into a table through an edit screen in the application. It has uh, role-based access, so there are data custodians and data stewards, uh, the steward having the ultimate responsibility, a custodian can maintain but not publish the data. So it maintains the data in a staging environment, which is described better in this picture. You have the published database, which is what external systems or ETL processes draw from. RTU has a workflow where you check out the data. So when you go to RTU, it shows you the, the status. And if it's checked out, it means somebody is working on it now. Uh, so the staging table is what RTU actually operates on. You can then download it to an Excel or ASCII file, maintain it with some desktop tool, upload it. And when you click the Promote button, that is when you have officially published the data to the enterprise. You can actually skip the download upload piece because, as I said, there's a built-in editor. You can, uh, <coughs> for uh, one-off entries or sm a small table maintenance, this is perfectly good. If you've got a somewhat larger data set, Excel is a good tool to, to keep it in. So the application itself has this data-driven uh, uh, design uh, where um, RTU, the only thing it really knows about is user roles and the workflow state in which a particular object 
is in and, and what actions you're allowed to perform based on that workflow state. Otherwise, all the other instructions are in metadata, either the native physical metadata or metadata star stored in RTU's uh, own application control tables. So it reads the semantics in the database catalog to get things like physical names, <coughs> column names, types, lengths, primary keys, all that good stuff. And then it augments this, or a, an administrator augments this, by adding a logical database name, a logical table and column name so that users see something more friendly, uh, <coughs> instructions about how to present the data, and validation rules about the data, which we'll des describe in uh, more detail in a sec. So we also established some uh, standards about how you model reference data uh, uh, under RTU maintenance. Um, here's the staging table, and it has three columns. So it's this made up, made up thing, customer types. You have a customer type code, a description, and a long description. Those are all business meaningful data, and if you had a spreadsheet, those would be the three columns in the spreadsheet that you upload to RTU. When you publish it, it then goes into this publish table, which has a lot more junk in it. First it has this thing, and now the primary key, rather than being the code, is some integer value, just dumb machine assigned value, and then there are a whole bunch of date columns. So the primary key, the business meaningful key, <coughs> is, is uh, what we have in the staging table. That becomes the alternate or natural key in the publish table. Um, we're, we're practicing here the rules of no physical deletes and no overwrites. So any time some data changes, we're end dating an old version of the row and inserting a new row. So typical date versioning kind of uh, policy. Um, so this gives you um, uh, history and auditability and it also incidentally supports rollback. Yeah, because you can specify a point in time, and at that point in time, only ro one row was effective for a given uh, natural key, right? Um, uh, do people n understand how data versioning works? Do you want to say an example? I need feedback. Yeah, we're good? Okay. So we'll just uh, flip, flip through these animations where you have a... Uh, I, I just want to point out, this is how we represent infinity in our systems, which means we have an inherent Y10K problem, and we better get to work on it now. Um, <clears throat> now, I know it seems like a long way off, but that was the attitude with Y2K also. You know, someday they're going to look back on those nuts from the 21st century and say, why did they saddle us with this problem? Uh, <laughs> and then you insert a new row, and you end date the previous one, and uh, uh, date the new effective one. And then when you finally come to delete something, after 331, it's, it's logically deleted. It's as if it never existed. But you can still, and, and downstream users, they're just looking for rows where the end date is greater than today, right? And, um, but it gives us the ability to do point in time querying and to do that rollback roll function as well. So we can look at a bunch of related data and find the reference data associated with it at the point in time that we're interested in. Exa exactly right, yeah. Um, so data validation and edit controls. Um, RTU, um, so uh, RTU treats every object as an independent thing. And it kind of has to because if you enforce a lot of constraints on the database, you would have real complexity about the sequence in which a user could load certain things and that kind of stuff. So everything is its own thing. Uh, but we can define... Uh, constraints and relationships and validity constraints in, in the uh, metadata maintained by RTU. Um, th those constraints, in fact, can be used uh, with other instructions by RTU to, uh, through, the, uh, through the data entry screen to just um, uh, restrict the entry through list boxes or other mechanisms to valid values. Um, so we have some simple validation constraint types like numeric or date ranges, con uh, constants, lists of values, defaults, uh, but more powerfully, we can do a SQL lookup to other tables. Uh, these rules, in, in turn, get represented in XML and sent off to the validation engine. The validation engine is actually abstracted into a service. So it's quasi-independent of RTU. We've defined uh, some XML based on some 
patterns that we found on the, on the internet for how you represent data validation rules in XML. And um, uh, so we operated actually as a, as a service. All this is administrator, administrated, why not? Administered through a very simple uh, user interface. Uh, so here uh, we have, <coughs> we've, we've defined an edit control type. So I want to pre I'll present this particular column, which is for product line code in a pull down menu. Um, we're going to use a SQL lookup to this, uh, this schema, this table, and this column. And if there's an error, we could specify a, cu a custom error message. And then I c depending on what I select, uh, this, this part of the screen is all AJAX. So depending on what I, I select here, what ref different things refresh here, and we, I can select a bunch of different, uh, uh, one of many different validation types for this thing. It's disconcerting to talk when you have a light flashing here. <laughs> yep. John, do you store the validation types inside of whatever you're using the application, or are they stored in some type of enterprise validation? Uh, the enterprise validation engine right now is the RTU validation service. Uh, but, the, but the types are, are defined in, in uh, RTU. They're extensible. They're defined in an XML structure in RTU. We're, we're working on that. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a later slide. Um, so, see, if I turn my back to him, then he won't click the button. Um, <laughs> I know. Uh, so, uh, uh, so here's how, it, how it's presented on the data entry screen. So the, this screen is rendered dynamically based on the, the metadata about the table. Oop, and uh, there's our uh, drop-down list for the product line code. And notice it has the nice English name that I gave it, and it's showing you the translation of the code, which is actually in a separate column from, from that lookup table. Um, here's something cute we're doing here. You type NA. Do people hate drop-down lists of the US states? I mean, if you're in Wyoming, you're really screwed. You've got to scroll all the way down to select it. So um, I prefer, everybody knows the abbreviation of a state, right? So you type MA, but we have it go, go look it up and do a little Ajaxy thing and echo back that you meant Massachusetts. So you have some uh, validation. If you're uploading, you'll get this little red thing on any row that had an error on it. And you can, you can actually filter down to just the error rows uh, here and uh, identify all the errors. We do a little trick that we actually number the first row of data, row two. So if you have your data in a spreadsheet, the number here matches the one in your spreadsheet. Um, so now we've evolved this tool over time to do all kinds of wonderful things. It's basically the Swiss army knife for maintaining any code set, that, any data set that doesn't originate in an application system. So um, we use it to maintain tables of application rules like inclusion and exclusion lists for reports or extracts, um, uh, other rules that are, that, that are data that get assembled into dynamic SQL queries for analytics. So when we're running certain analytics and the, and the rules about them change, we can adjust some data rather than adjusting program code. Um, we've made it database neutral. So uh, we connect to Oracle SQL Server. Uh, we're doing a Teradata connector next week, actually. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and multiple schemas. So the CRC, uh, as all these other use cases for RTU came in, we wanted to keep CRC pure as just for enterprise reference data. So we can now uh, uh, configure what schema as well as what uh, database server it goes against. Yes. N no, if it originates in the suite, it, it, it stays there. Okay. This is being, being used by, uh, by other systems. That's right. We, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't violate the, that sacred ground. Um, uh, we can do complex validations now through a scripting language called Groovy. Groovy is an open source scripting uh, language <coughs> that actually you can write whole applications in. It's, it's Java-like. Um, uh, it it uh, operates as a, uh, as a kind of standalone service as well as, as we're using it. So uh, the, the, we pass um, 
uh, the script at runtime to the Groovy engine, which compiles it and runs it on the fly. And now we can do things like if column A equals such and column B equals the other, then column C must be between this and that. Uh, we can do lookups to multiple, you know, SQL queries to multiple places. We can even do some data um, uh, derivation or data cleansing. Uh, so we can say to a user, <coughs> uh, upload a member number and an effective date. We'll go validate uh, that that member was effective on that date and based on that point in time, populate some other values so that you aren't tasked with A, entering them and B, possibly getting them wrong. Um, so it, re very, it becomes really wildly flexible. We introduced the, the concept of partitioned virtual tables within a table. Um, so what this allows you to do is uh, you can have many data stewards, each responsible for a subset of, say, a classification scheme. They can all share the same physical structure, but, it, but each of their data sets looks like an in independent table to them. So, so their role permissions are on the partition, not on the table. Um, and we made versioning optional. So you can have uh, an, an audit table, which just has, you know, create and update and last user dates. You can have a version table. You can have a partition table. You can combine any of those types. And RTU just knows how to handle <coughs> all the date adjustment and population of system fields and that kind of thing. So like I say, it's a Swiss Army knife right now. And <coughs> therefore, it has some uh, ROI. So we've got more than 200 users. Uh, the 540 number, when I put that in a month or so ago, is now out of date. We've got, had at least eight or ten new tables go into production over the last month. Um, and because of the partitioning, there are around 1,800 discrete data sets represented in this. So you can, you can just in, intuitively sense that there must be ROI around this tool. Uh, and in fact, uh, by eliminating the churn for re all the fine print, you know, like a drug advertisement, all the fine print reasons down here, uh, w which you can read on your own, uh, we estimate we save about $100,000 a year alone. We spent about 85000 on version one of this thing, which means it paid for itself in under a year. Uh, and obviously, you get all the uh, <coughs> implicit ROI from empowering business stewards, re uh, re reducing ETL and application maintenance costs, ensuring data quality, analytical consistency, and the support for our ongoing master data strategy. So let's take a quick, quick trip through SOA land. My friend Dave McComb is sitting in the room six, seven years ago. I learned a lot of this stuff from him, and now we're actually doing it. Um, here are some of the major objects in our solar system. So I'm only showing that you know, the really big ones. Each of them has many moons of subsystems revolving around them. And there's also an asteroid belt of all the other little applications that exist in any enterprise, you know, in desktops and access databases and so on. Um, so but just, but just you know, wipe the, the asteroid belt from your mind and just look, behold these wonderful heavenly bodies. Um, now, uh, so th this at an extremely high level is how we've sort of federated our approach. Now, if you enroll a member, you need to know what customer that member belongs to and what products that customer has said that member can enroll in. Um, if you have a claim pricing system, it needs to be aware of what contract you have with the provider it's pricing a claim for. If you're adjudicating a claim, you need to know a whole bunch of things. And when you're federated, how do you do this effectively, efficiently, high quality, so on and so forth. And of course, you set up a wonderful enterprise message bus or enterprise services bus where <coughs> uh, nobody is talking directly to its neighbor or needs to know anything about its neighbor, neighbor's data structure. It needs to know how to interface with this thing. And so this is um, uh, uh, folks at the Lightning Talks last night. This is the canonicalization uh, example that Dan McCreary was talking about last night. So service-oriented architecture, it's about the loosely coupled distributed systems integrated via web services. It uses prescribed interfaces, which are in the form of XML messages in canonical form, which you can just think of as a standard that is independent of any particular application system. Um, uh, internet protocols are canonicals. You know, things like FTP and SMTP, those are standard forms that are independent of the particular system they're communicating with. This is the same sort of idea. So each system in, the, in this process is a black box with respect to the other one, uh, and which means that a data consumer is insulated from 
changes in the data producer. In fact, we could, you know, we, you know, we are going to swap out the provider system of record over the next year and a half. Uh, if we've done our work right, the consumers of provider data today will be largely, okay, I hedged it a little bit, my, largely unaffected. unaffected. The, the, the provider canonical uh, will remain intact. Um, so the emphasis then becomes really on specifying the standard interface rather than on um, uh, you know, all the other details about um, uh, the data exchange. So this poses a bunch of new challenges. It means the end of silos. Uh, application owners used to uh, you know, operate happily in their own uh, silo, but they are now sharing their data with the enterprise where they are the system of record for a particular domain. Um, uh, I almost a couple years ago reached across the table and strangled a project manager who was try trying to encourage him that some data that used to lie under a web app that we were rebuilding as a, as a SOA enabled app and we were getting rid of the underlying database, that some data elements now needed to be in the CRM system of records, their customer data. And he said, well, it's really a system in service to sales. And I said, no, it's a, service in s it's a system in service to the enterprise. So there's a whole mental model shift that happens when you go to a, a SOA environment. Um, systems are functioning in an ecosystem. Uh, the, uh, we used to confront the data integration challenges that we <coughs> do on the enter enterprise message bus way downstream in the data warehouse, uh, you, you where a lot of our data management and data integration disciplines originated. Now we're moving that upstream to the operational environment, which means establishing your master data sources really becomes critical. The need for data governance becomes extremely acute, and you require system-neutral descriptions and representations of data, which includes your enterprise reference data. Dun, da, 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 RTU to the rescue. Um, so <coughs> as an example, Yes, uh, we can get into a whole separate long. That, that's that's another presentation <laughs> on on uh, how you how you design SOA services and some lessons learned from the way we we did that. Um, it, we've in fact we we swung the pendulum very far in one direction and we're now bringing it back to a more sensible uh, middle. Um, so <clears throat> for so where reference data is concerned in the enterprise message bus area. Here are code values for gender as they might be in three systems. Male, female, unknown, zero and one. Oh, true story. We just bought a, an analytical package from a pri prominent vendor who will remain nameless uh, that w is actually st stitched together three products they acquired. And so you feed a bunch of claims data into it and it does some magical things and requires the gender of the, of the patient. In one system, the codes are M and F and in the other system, the codes are zero and one. Same product suite, same vendor, two different code domains. Um, uh, here's an example, 101, 201, 301, da-da-da. Um, there are some healthcare organizations that have eight gender codes. Now that's because in addition to male and female, they have male transitioning to female, female transitioning to male, male formerly female, female formerly male. Things that are probably important in a clinical setting or in a clini clinical problem space, but maybe not important to other parts of the enterprise. So what do you do in the, in the message bus area? Say, well, these aren't important to everybody. We're going to collapse them down to male, female, or unknown, um, uh, where, which is what most people are worried about. Um, or there may be another clinical, clinically oriented system that needs all of this d detail. You can still carry it on the message in its own kind of private area, or you might develop a point-to-point -point interface with that particular consumer. But, uh, but the point is, you've you got to have some governance discussion about what you're going to do on the message bus. This isn't just a data warehouse problem anymore. It's now an enterprise operational problem. Uh, another similar example, here are descriptions of three different codes for dependent type, domestic partner, life partner, spousal equi equivalent. Semantically equivalent terms, just different words. What are we going to agree, agree on for our enterprise standards? So that's a long way of saying, Code sets need standardization, descriptions, names need standard, uh, standardization, and you need to d define <coughs> and maintain the translation rules uh, as you push these uh, uh, codes and descriptions across your enterprise bus. So all this stuff now converges in, in this picture. 
uh, so you have coded data elements that need to be translated to an enterprise standard or decoded, that kind of thing. And I'm oversimplifying because not all things are code description. Some are code description, long description, really long description. Uh, some have other metadata attributes. So you can't uh, d design something totally generic in this problem space. But for a large portion of it, you can get highly generic. So you have you know, a couple of systems sharing the, the enterprise bus. We're, this is work in, pro work in progress. We're building an enterprise code lookup service that as part of it, so remember I mentioned the, the other data stores for industry standard codes? Those will be comprehended by the code lookup service as well as, well as our good old friend, the CRC, for doing things like saying, how do we take eight gender codes and collapse them to three? Um, and that means that the data already established data governance process and the data stewards who have the tool RTU come into play here. So we've now taken this tool set originated in the analytics integration space and we're leveraging the same tools and processes in the operational space. So in conclusion, I'm going to uh, end uh, quickly and then we can um, have time for some more questions. Um, some takeaways. <coughs> the general point, re reference data is an essential part of master data strategy. Um, it shouldn't be um, uh, uh, assumed to be taken care of as you're working in the customer or product or other domains. It, it should have its own holistic kind of approach. Um, as you're looking for MDM tools, um, uh, look for things that will empower the business experts with the process and, as processes and tools to govern and maintain uh, this data. Don't make it a, a, uh, an IT problem and avoid churn and rework. Make sure you have you know, validation tools and processes in place. And um, uh, RTU operates at the convergence of master data quality and governance. They really are all related, and so should your solution mindset as you look for a, a solution in this problem space. And um, also, if it hasn't been explicit, your master data hub doesn't necessarily need to be a physical thing. You can virtualize it, as, as we've done in this picture. So uh, <laughs> the Oracle CRM is our customer system of record. The enterprise bus virtualizes the master data hub for anybody who needs uh, um, authoritative customer data. And similarly now for, for reference data. And then uh, finally, I borrowed, the, anybody go to David Lotion's uh, tutorial uh, Monday? Um, I borrowed this picture from him. He you know, does this 24, your 24 month uh, you know, roadmap to Nirvana. Um, and um, so he shows uh, master reference data as one of the entry points in, a, in an MDM strategy, sort of culminating with analytics integration. But we really move this box way down here and shuffle some of these others, right? So the, the only point being that th these are all, uh, and, and David agrees with this, these are all valid destinations on your MDM journey, but your particular roadmap might take you there in a different sequence. And with that, I'll conclude and take questions. We have, we have five minutes. Please. In uh, one of the prior presentations, um, like the Allstate metadata presentation, he was talking about how they map the code between systems so they have a truly um, master domain and then they map the values from system A. So system A calls it 0, 1, it's on your slide 35. Yep. Like Sure. You're, you're the central, so do you have like a screen that shows them? We would, we would have a cross-reference table that essentially provides that map. S uh, system A, value, uh, you know, original value, translated value. Translated value validated against the enterprise code set, and we could make a call out to sequence A for this value to make sure that it actually exists in that system. So are, are business users, like a SAS user, comes in and want the lookup to, to you know, do a join? He, he, he could, theoretically, but more typically, he's going to be a warehouse user where we've already done the translation to an enterprise standard for him. 
right. Right. So um, we, we do, for any code field, we pretty uniformly do VARCAR 20. And don't you know we had a new system introduced that has a sort of long keyworded code that exceeds that and we had to change one table. But typically we do VARCAR 20 and for descriptions VARCAR 100 because we figured that will accommodate most everything. Short and long no, no, a lot long description. We may do VARCAR 250 or VARCAR 500 or something. Uh, numbers as description, not typically. We, we will use numbers, we, we will often use meaningless codes because nobody really looks at the code anyway. They're, they're, uh, they're interested in its meaning. Um, uh, there was one other thing I was going to say about that which just flew out of my head, but it'll come back to me. Dave? So you mentioned 160 uh, data sets that are real enterprise reference data, and later you said there's 1,800 sets that are being managed by the tool in total. No, that's all that other stuff that we, we people glommed onto RTU to use as, as the Swiss Army knife. So, so either an internal data set that they're not sharing or an external one in the outside world? Is that um, not, well, not directly external, but it, it's, um, uh, um, well, so for example, uh, we collect metadata about our data warehouse and ELDM and everything else in Excel spreadsheets. All that is loaded to our meta model through RTU loaded and validated through RTU. So that's, you know, a gazillion things right there. Um, uh, all the rule sets for HEDIS measures that we do annually for NCQA, uh, those are all represented in rules that are used to, gen to generate dynamic SQL. Uh, uh, those are all, and there are, you know, hundreds of those. So, so you, yeah, um, and um, all these report drivers for, you know, uh, customer specific ETL things where they, or uh, data extracts where they want um, uh, to be uh, filtered or aggregated in a certain way, all those rule sets are maintained through RTU. So, so the yeah. rule isn't a long description? Or no, the. It depends on what the rule is. It, it, it can be, a, it can be a, a set of columns that, that can be used for dynamic SQL. It can be uh, two columns, one describing the particular uh, report purpose and one a list of, of uh, customer numbers to include or exclude from that particular uh, report, that kind of thing. Yeah. We didn't do that so uh, the latter so much. Although we we did identify more things we wanted to create cross references to uh, to rationalize. Um, but um, uh, yeah, the the thirty four or whatever the number was was the initial inventory of all these independent code sets that were maintained. Uh, mostly by f uh, finance analysts um, uh, that um, uh, were for uh, the particular application we were first building on top of EDW uh, that they they knew intimately. So they said, "Oh, here are all the here are all the little data sets we keep." But then, as we as we started building out the EDW and discovering more of them, it grew and grew. We, we are now, because as we're implementing more robust system, more robust uh, tra transactional systems than our old uh, somewhat limited, uh, you know, mainframey thing, um, uh, we should be able to source more of that from these new systems of record uh, than we were able to get from the old one. So I have a feeling we, uh, that uh, some of these cross-references will go away uh, because we have more robust uh, data coming from the new applications, uh, or we may augment the cross references we use in our rationalization or categorization schemes just to include these new reference domains. Time for one more, yes, sir. Uh, do you harmonize the reference data uh, before you put it in the system or afterwards? And if it gets in there and it's useful to a division but it's not harmonized, do you ever get around to harmonizing it? How do you, how do you force that? 
So well, by the system, do you mean the warehouse specifically? Or? No, so CRC is, is the place where uh, you might maintain uh, um, w what you want as your enterprise standard, plus a cross-reference or, or one or many cross-references of all the data coming from your enterprise standard uh, from, your, from your other systems that you need to translate to the standard, um, as well as um, uh, a cross-reference of source data into a more um, uh, aggregated categorization scheme. So that means it's harmonized when it's put in. It, it is. It, it, that's, it, it, that is where the harmonization occurs. And then that, the result of that gets reflected in places like the Enterprise Warehouse and other places. So um, great. I'll be around the rest of the conference if, we, if you have any more questions. Thanks for coming. <laughs>